Good morning. I want to start this morning by simply asking you, why are you here? Are you here because today is Sunday, you, you kind of feel obligated to check off a box? Or when you woke up this morning, did you honestly desire to draw closer to Him? It is my hope this morning that we are all here for the right reason and I know everybody in this room, you got lots of stuff going on in your lives. I, I know many of you have got things like stress at work. I, I know some of you have got papers in school, you've got tests coming up. I, I know some of you have got physical ailments that you are dealing with on a regular basis. I, I'm going to ask that over the next few minutes that you put all of that aside and that you open your hearts, you open your minds, and let's see if we can't draw closer to Him. This morning, if I were to ask you, is there a, is there a difference between being convinced and convicted? What would you say? You know, right now, the majority of people in America, and I, I will get my PowerPoint up, I promise, it's thinking about it. Right now, the majority of people in America, they say they're convinced there's a God. There's a higher power out there. But right now in America, I don't think very many people are very convicted about it. Because if they really were convicted about it, I don't think we would have all the immorality that we've got around us today. In fact, if they really were convicted about it, I think our country would be a totally different place. You think about somebody like Noah for just a moment. Imagine if all he was, was convinced that God is real. God comes to him and says, Noah, I, I want you to build a boat. I want you to be the one to save mankind. Imagine if Noah was like some of us. You know, he, he basically looks at God and says, God, I believe you're real. I, I think you're out there. In fact, I'll even give you, I'll give you an hour every Sunday. What happens if he never, ever picks up his hammer? Folks, you and I wouldn't be here today. And I want to start by pointing out, Satan doesn't mind you being here this morning. In fact, he doesn't mind you listening to prayers. He doesn't mind you singing. He doesn't mind you being here as long as you don't get real convicted about it. In fact, think with me for just a moment about how he has basically perverted the way we even think about God's Word today. And what do I mean by that? Think about Noah. Let's stick with him for just a minute. If I were to mention Noah and the ark, what do most of our kids think about when they think about that particular boat? At the end of the day, most of our kids, if I say Noah and the ark, they think about two giraffes sticking their head out of the window of a boat. I don't think we really get it. You know, we, we sing the songs, we buy the flat books, we buy the little plastic boats. Now, please hear me when I say this. I, none of that is wrong, okay? I've got four kids, we got the flat books, we got the little plastic boat somewhere in my house. But if all our children ever get is the idea of that right there, they're totally missing the mark. You know, do we understand how many people died in that particular event? And do we get that this is the deadliest event that has ever hit this earth? I don't think so, church. And one of the reasons I say I don't think so is because when I go to congregations all across this planet, a lot of times I'll wander around in the buildings, I'll look at various classrooms, 
Look at bulletin board. Do you know what we have in almost every nursery in the church? We got Noah and his ark. Now, follow me for just a minute. This is the deadliest event that has ever hit this earth. And yet we put a picture of it in there with our babies. Folks, that's messed up if you stop and think about it. I told my wife, I said, I want to go around with a Sharpie marker and start drawing dead people all over the place. Just so people will think. This morning, I want to give it to you in a way in which I hope you will remember. I believe that the ark was a piece of wood God used to deliver his elect, just eight people. That was a foreshadowing of another piece of wood he uses today to deliver his elect, the cross. And yet, as we talked about during our last hour, I don't think we're telling too many people about it. If you've got your Bible, please open it up. Genesis chapter 6 with me. We're going to get started in verse 17. Take a look. Genesis chapter 6, verse 17. And behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which there is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. Please do not read that and let it just roll off you like water on the back of a duck. Look at what he's actually saying right here. God is about to wipe out everything. You ever seen an animal or, or a human drown? We lost my wife's oldest brother in the Gulf of Mexico a couple of years back. Drowned. You know, initially they, they take water into their lungs. They go underwater for a few minutes. And then that lifeless body will pop right back up to the surface, and they will float lifelessly on the surface of the water for days, for weeks, and in the right condition, even months, as they slowly start to decompose. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to imagine being Noah for just a moment, right? You walk out on the top deck of that boat, and as far as your eye can see, all you see is every animal and every human floating lifelessly that didn't make it onto that boat. Can you imagine the stench? You'd never get it out of your nostrils. That's a different picture. Isn't it? That, that's not two cute little giraffes sticking their head out of the window of a boat. No, what that is, that's the picture of sin and the wrath of God. And yet, because one guy was convicted enough to pick up his hammer, you and I are here today. One guy, the Bible describes this way, three different things. It says Noah, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, was a just man. He was perfect in his generations, and he walked with God. And yet, ironically, if you go by sheer numbers alone, this guy was a failure. And you say, Brad, why in the world would you ever call Noah a failure? Well, stop and think about it for just a minute. Here's a guy who, according to the text, he preached for roughly 100 years. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 tells us God didn't spare the ancient world, but he preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness. Here's a guy, he's preaching for roughly 100 years, and he never converted anybody outside of his family. What about his, his best friend? Did he get his best friend on the boat? How about his closest neighbor? The one that had to hear that constant banging, the nailing, the hammer. Did he get him on the boat? Just eight. I mean, let's, let's get real. Let's, let's. If you guys... We're doing a preacher search committee. And I know you're not, right? You got a good one, by the way. I'm still amazed you got him. <laughs> Let's say you're doing a preacher search. You tell all the candidates, you say, look, we want somebody who is really good with one-on-one -on -one evangelism. 
personal evangelism. So you start parading them in, you march them in, you're doing the, the preacher search thing, and you get a candidate, he is smiling from ear to ear. He say, hey, how good are you at, at personal work? And he looks at you, he smiles, and he says, well, in the last hundred years, I, I've, I've saved my family. Let's be honest, church, you know what we would do? We would pat that guy on the back, and we would send him packing, okay? But please don't miss this point right here. At least he got his family on the boat. Amen? Church, we got way, way too many of our own family. We're not getting on the boat. In fact, I tell people it's like this. We, we kind of got our collective bucket, our church family, right? We're doing things to try to add people to our church family, and yet all the while we got this massive hole in the bottom of our bucket, and in too many cases, it's our own families that are going out the bottom. So I'll say again, at least he got his family on the boat. In fact, flip it, look with me, Genesis chapter 6, verse 22 the Bible says, thus Noah did according to all that God commanded it, him, so he did. This morning, I want to simply start over here, work my way all the way around, and just ask you, hey, if God needed a Noah today, could he count on you? Could he count on me? Or, or would we do what we like to do in other areas of our life? And start offering up excuses. And some of you in this room, you know exactly what I'm talking about. They usually start about age 14, 15, 16, where after we've been baptized, we tell God something like this. Lord, you know I'm in school right now. You, you know, Lord, I got algebra, calculus. Tell you what, God, let me get out of school. Then I'll give you 110%. And that day finally comes. And he hears something like this. Lord, just let me get my career started. You, you let me get my family started, and then I, I'll be a Bible class teacher. I'll be there every time the doors are open. And that day happens. And he hears something like this. Lord, just let me get these children raised and out of the house. You know right now, Lord, I'm basically a taxi service going from recitals to ball practice to... Just, Lord, just let me get them out of the house, and then we'll start having people into our house and devos and all kinds of, I'll serve as a deacon. And that day finally happens. And he hears something like this, Lord, just let me hit retirement. You let me hit retirement, I'll be an elder. I, I'll, I'll give you everything I got, Lord. And finally that day happens. And in too many cases, he hears something like this, Lord, just let me rest. I'm tired. Church, let me ask you, let's get real. What excuse are you offering up this morning? Because notice what the text says. Genesis chapter 6, verse 22, thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him. Last time I checked, everybody in this room that wears the name Christian, you've been given a command, and that command is to go and to make disciples. I'm going to pause for just a moment, and we're going to offer up a prayer because I think that would be appropriate. Join me in prayer. Glorious God and Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to gather as a church family to worship and praise you. And at this time right now, Heavenly Father, we ask you to be with the one who is hurting, who is sick, be with the ones that are attending to them. Hold them in your hand. Help them to get the care that they need. Help us to be your hands and your feet. And Heavenly Father, help us to focus our lives on you. We thank you so much for this time, this worship that we gather together. We ask your continued blessings on it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Turn in your Bible to Genesis chapter 7, verse 11. 
Genesis chapter 7, verse 11, we read, In the 600th year of Noah's life, the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were open. Yeah, you ever wonder why does it give the year, the month, and the day? I, I'll tell you why. Because if I say the words 9-11 in this room, everybody under the age of about 25 or over the age of 25, you know exactly where you were on 9-11. And yet, what we're talking about this morning makes 9-11 look like child's play. Because never in the history of the world have we lost that many people. And yet, here you've got a guy, the text says, he walked with God. He was convicted enough to pick up his hammer and do what God commanded. So what, what was his reward? I mean, think about it. We, we kind of think this way, right? We, we think if we do what God wants, then we're going to get something in return, right? And because we are American Christians, and I can say this because I do my work all over the world, because we're Americans, what we really mean is, did he get stuff? Anybody in here think Noah got rich from the flood? You realize everything was wiped out? Everything. I, I had one lady one time, she actually came up to me after a sermon. She said, well, you know, he could have put some of his furniture on that boat. I said, you are right. I said, tell me this, would you want that furniture after it's been on an ark with all those animals for 371 days? In fact, first thing Noah did when he got off, the, he, he built an altar, right? I'm thinking, if I need some wood, I know where I'm going. He didn't get rich. All right, how about this? Did he get an easy life? <laughs> Think about that for just a minute. He had to restart civilization. I'm looking at some of you guys in this room. You take away running, you take away Wi-Fi for some of these people. Y'all start twitching. He didn't get an easy life. Did he get children? It's interesting. When you read through Genesis chapter 5, you're going to notice that it talks about the person who is named in the genealogies. Then the text says this little phrase after every single one of them. It says, they had sons, plural, and daughters, plural. You realize that means every single one of them had to have at least five kids? Son of record, sons, and daughters. What about Noah? Noah. He only had three. So, so he didn't get children. He didn't get rich. He didn't get an easy life. What did he get? Folks, he got to get on the boat. Now, have you reached that point in your spiritual walk where you understand your reward for righteousness is not about stuff? It's not about an easy life. It's not about money. Again, church, I'm not 100% sure we're there. Because I've had some conversations with Christians, and I hear them complaining and saying things like this. You know, Brad, it's just not fair. I, I, I work with a non-Christian. He's got a bigger house than I do. Now, he drives nicer cars than I do. Or, or they've got better clothes than I do. Their children go to, to nicer schools than mine do. And all the while, I'm sitting there thinking to myself, yeah, but they're not getting on the boat. Do you really honestly want to trade your salvation for more square footage? How convicted are you this morning? Because let me make sure you understand, if you weren't clinging to that wood called the ark, you perished. And this morning, I want to make sure you understand, if you're not clinging to that wood called the cross, you're going to perish. 
In fact, most scholars would say about 1.34 billion people died in the billion with a B. 1.3 billion people died in the flood. And you say, how in the world could a loving God do How could he wipe out that many people? That's not the right question. The right question is, how could a righteous God not do it? Because the text says, the thoughts of man were on evil, what's the next word? Continually. So now I'm going to get personal with you. Who walked into this auditorium this morning thinking you deserve the safety of the ark rather than drowning in the flood? And by that I mean this. Who of your own accord has lived your life in such a way in which you think you should deserve the safety of that boat rather than drowning in a flood? Because folks, if we're honest, and this morning you're going to find out I'm brutally honest, if we're honest... Every person of an accountable age in this room has done something in which we deserve the fires of hell. I know right now there's a few of you out there thinking, you can't judge me. I ain't killed anybody. (laughs) Yeah, okay, let's put murder over here on the shelf for just a second. What about all of your thoughts? Have all your thoughts been holy? What, What about... All those videos you've scrolled through this last week, have they been holy? All the words that have come out of your lips the last week, have they been holy? You see, sometimes, church, what we do is we we compare ourselves to the world and we say, ah, we're not like them. (laughs) Yeah, well, this morning I'm comparing you to a holy God, reminding you you're not like him either. So I'll say it again. Everybody in this room has done something in which we deserve the fires of hell. Here's my follow-up question. How many of us are really thankful for that second piece of wood? See, the ark was a piece of wood God used to deliver his elect. That was a foreshadowing of another piece of wood he uses today to deliver his elect, the cross. And yet my fear is we're content not to tell anybody about it. If my wife were here this morning, she would tell you that during our first few years of marriage, I did all the cooking. I know you're streaming this, so I'm going to make sure I look at the camera and say this real clear. Not because she's a bad cook. My wife is a great cook, as you can tell. The reason I did most of the cooking in our early years of marriage is because all through high school, I actually worked part-time in a catering business. Spent three and a half years learning how to to decorate cakes, cook large meals. I I love to cook. To me, cooking is like de-stressing. Notice I said cook and not clean. My wife would point that out too. I I love it. For three and a half years, I worked beside a lady in her 60s named Maybell Johnson. All through high school, as crazy as it sounds, she was basically my best friend. Because she was there. Every day I'd get out of school and I'd be complaining about trigonometry or geometry or calc. I hated math in high school. And there she was. She was showing me how to do things investing in my life. But as as life often does, we parted ways. I went off to, to college in Kentucky. Four years later, I came home and I married quite literally the girl down the street. My wife lived 0.8 miles down the street from me. We'd gone to high school together as friends. And I remember it was Maybelle who made my groom's cake. And she came up during the reception. She tugged on my lapels. She said, Brad, what are you going to do with your life? I went off to medical school for six years. And that's really when everything kind of changed because we started out in an apartment, got a, a little starter home. We moved several times. 
Maybelle retired during that time. She moved a couple of times, and I completely lost track of her until about six years ago. And folks, as long as God gives me a brain, I will not forget that day. My family, we were in a gray Tahoe traveling to Abilene, Texas for a weekend seminar. Her grandson named Casey had tracked me down through the magazine we publish. There are not that many Harobs in the world. He called my office. My office patched him through to my cell phone. And I hear this voice say, hey, uh, Mr. Brad, you may not remember me. My name's Casey. I'm Maybelle's grandson. I knew exactly who he was. He was a squirt when I was in high school. He used to pester me to death. He said, Maybelle is in Baptist Hospital. She's having a, a, a small procedure done. She would love to talk to you. He says, she talks about you almost every single month. And so he gave me the number to her hospital room. I called her up. And to this day, I still remember one of the first things I said to her. I said, Maybelle, you're not going to believe this. I have four children now. And I spent some time catching up with her, finding out why she was having surgery. And I told her, I said, look, give me your phone number. Give me your address because when I get home Monday, I'm coming to see you. And so she told me, she said, Brad, we just built a house in Chapel Hill, Tennessee. They haven't installed my phone yet. Let me give you my address. So I reached over. I, I grabbed a little piece of paper. I put it on the steering wheel. I, don't y'all judge me because y'all done the same thing. I wrote down her address, and I told her, I said, when I come home, I'm coming to see you. Now, I'll go ahead and tell you guys. When I, when I preach, I usually bring a lot of passion because who the message is about. But that particular weekend, man, I had some extra pep in my step because I just knew when I got home, I was coming to see my best friend from high school. We pulled into our house in Franklin, Tennessee, and I couldn't find that little piece of paper. In fact, to this day, I don't know if it fell out at a gas station, if it got lost in some of the kids' stuff. I know we spent several hours tearing up a, a Tahoe looking for that little piece of paper. Never found it. In fact, the next Monday, I drove every street of a little town called Chapel Hill, Tennessee, hoping to see my friend outside. Never saw her. In fact, did not hear from her again until about three years ago when Casey tracked me down again to let me know she'd passed away. I need everybody in this room to listen to what I'm about to say. I have to live the rest of my life knowing my best friend stepped out into eternity unprepared because she was not a New Testament Christian. And the one thing she really needed to hear she hadn't. See, my, my life had changed radically from high school to today. I learned, discovered the truth, and that one thing I needed to tell her, I didn't get the chance. And I suspect if you guys were honest with me this morning, every one of you in this room, you know of somebody who fits that description. Somebody who, if, if they were to step out into eternity today, they're not ready. Well, let me remind you, every single hour, on average, 6,316 people are stepping out into eternity. Most of them unprepared. You see, we came into this world with a date that we're not going to miss. It's called your expiration date. I know right now in this room, there is at least two or three families who are habitually late to everything. Don't look at them. You know who I'm talking about. It's the families you got to tell to be there 10 minutes early so they're on time, right? They won't be late to this. We, we don't like thinking about it. In fact, 
we don't like talking or thinking about death or, or hell or, or Satan. So here's what our culture has gotten accustomed to doing. Instead of actually talking about it, thinking about it, we joke about it. We make light of it. Well, this morning I want to share with you what I think is one of the most frightening verses of all time. If you've got your Bible, go ahead and open it up to Mark chapter 10. To me, this is one of the most terrifying passages. In fact, if you scare easy, you may want to just reach down, hold on to that seat. Take a look at Mark chapter 10, verse 18. So Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one. That is God. Right about now, some of you are looking at that passage, looking at me thinking, <laughs> what's so scary about that? God is good. Amen? You're not. I don't ever get the amen on that one. Folks, God is good. And all the time he is good. Let me back it up with Scripture. Isaiah chapter 64 verse 6 tells us the best we got to offer him is like filthy rags. Romans chapter 3 verse 23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Who does that leave out? <laughs> Nobody. And you're still sitting there right now, some of you are sitting there thinking, I'm not that bad. Let me prove it to you. If I could put on these screens right beside me, everything you've ever done in secret, every thought you've ever had, everything that has loosely come running out of your lips, and I could play it like a movie on these screens, you would do one of two things. You would either tackle me to make sure I couldn't show it, or you would run out of this building never to show your face again. Because the truth is, you've done things you don't want your best friend to know about. In fact, some of you, in the last 24 hours, you've done things you don't want anybody to know about. So I'll say it again. God is good. We're not. Now, what does a good God do with us? What I'm about to share with you is what we often call the gospel. Sometimes we don't define it real good well. <laughs> you better believe this morning I'm going to define it for you. In fact, open your Bible to Exodus chapter 34. Exodus chapter 34, starting in verse 6. You say, time out, Brad. Hold up, man. That's Old Testament. We're, we're talking about the gospels, the New Testament. Yeah, but in Exodus chapter 34, it's kind of set up for us. Because in Exodus 34, we find God actually describing himself. If you ever want to know what God is like, go to the source. Look at what it says. Verse 6, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God merciful and gracious that sound good to anybody? Long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Folks, that right there is phenomenal. But it doesn't stop there, does it? Because the passage goes on to say, by no means clearing the guilty. Okay, I've highlighted it. You see the problem? How can God be merciful, gracious, long-suffering, but by no means clear the guilty? What, what does that mean? Take a look. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 15. He who justifies the wicked, he who condemns the just, both of them alike are an abomination to the Lord. How can God... Knowing all the wicked things you've ever done, thought, said, how can he justify you without being an abomination to himself? That's the crux of the gospel. In fact, let me give it to you in a way in which you won't forget. Let's say it's Monday night. You walk into your house and you realize every one of your family members has been killed. In fact, you walk in 
and you realize the killer is there. He's got his hands around the throat of the last remaining victim in your family, and about 0.2 milliseconds, your brain puts the scene together, and you realize you just caught this guy red-handed, literally red-handed, and he's killed your whole family. Now, you, you've got the element of surprise in your favor, and, and so you cross the room, and, and instead of taking all your vengeance out on this guy, you tie him up, and with tears racing down your face, you call the authorities and you tell them, come quick, you just caught this guy, and he's killed your whole family. Let me tell you something, word would travel like lightning. This entire church family would hear about it in about 30 minutes. They would hear that you walked in and you caught the guy who killed your family. And for the next four months of your life, you know what you would do? You'd grieve, but you'd also wait for your day in court. And after four long, agonizing months, you would walk into that courtroom. You're sitting on one side. That cold-blooded killer, he's sitting on the other side. The judge is listening to all the testimony. And you finally get your moment in the box. And you look at that judge and you say, look, I caught this guy red-handed. He's killed my whole family. How would you feel if that judge looked down at that killer and said, I'm a gracious judge, merciful, long-suffering. You're free to go. Folks, I guarantee everybody in this room, including myself, at that point, you would be irate, not just with the killer, you'd also be mad at who? The judge. Because a judge is supposed to deliver justice. All right, how about we do this? How about we put the judge of the universe right here, and now you're on the stand for everything you've ever thought, said, or done, and yet you want him to say not guilty? How can he do that? That's the gospel. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He made him, he made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin for us. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 24, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you are healed. Isaiah 53 written about 700 years before Jesus walked this earth. The prophet, he prophesied, he said, we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Go back in your mind for just a moment, about 2,000 years to a garden scene where Jesus, he is praying in agony. The text says his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling to the ground, which is very ironic because later in the night, a guy named Peter is going to be so cold, he's going to need to warm himself by fire as he denies Jesus. He's sweating, and he prays, Father, if it's your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will but yours be done. You ever wonder what was in that cup that he didn't want? What was in the cup? I'll tell you what was in the cup. It was the wrath of Almighty God on every sin you've ever committed. He didn't want it. Take this cup. Nevertheless, not my will, but your. what was God's will? It was that he would be crushed bruised. I read for you Romans 3, 23 just a moment ago. Skip down to verse 26, where it says that God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness. That he might be, notice this, if I put a period after that word just, <laughs> nobody in here has got any hope. 
Because if all God is is a just God, then what we should hear is depart from me. But the text goes on to say that he might be just and the what? Justifier. In fact, Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. In order for you to be blessed this morning, somebody had to be cursed. And that somebody was Jesus Christ. Now, I know I've already probably gone, I was going to say gone longer than Eric, but I don't think that's possible. (laughs) He'll get me back. I am going to take three or four more minutes of your time this morning because we got to talk for just a second about what that curse was he saved us from. Because here's what I know. I know in Franklin, Tennessee, in Nashville, Tennessee, in Austin, Texas, in Round Rock, there are people whose lives are so busy that we don't, we seldom slow down enough to think about what it is, what did he save us from? We call him our Savior. Take a look. Matthew chapter 25, verse 46, Jesus said, these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life everlasting punishment in fact in Matthew chapter 8 he describes this place he says there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth which is really interesting to me because we sometimes sing a song no tears in heaven there are going to be tears here I need everybody in this room to understand that that Jesus that you call your Savior, that you believe in, most definitely himself believes in a place of torment and destruction. And you say, okay, but but does it really go on and on? Maybe we'll just burn up and won't even feel it. That's what some of our Christian universities are teaching. It's called the annihilation theory. The idea that, well, you know, okay, if you're going to be punished, you're just, you're ashes. You're kind of like cremation. You won't feel it. You're done. Well, how about this? How about instead of letting some Looney Tune liberal professor tell us, how about we go to this right here? Okay. Open your Bible to Revelation chapter 20 where the Bible says in verse 10, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now skip down and look at the last verse of that chapter, verse 15. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This morning, right now, every single person in this room ought to be asking yourself just one question. Is my name in the book of life? Young people, I'm, I want your attention for just a minute. I'm going to tell you something you may not ever hear from another gospel preacher. And that is, if you make the wrong decision with your life and you end up in hell and you've been there 150,000 years, you know what you got to look forward to? 150,000 more and, 100, and it will just keep on going. In fact, Revelation chapter 21 tells us some of the people who are going to be there. We always go to liars in this verse. Notice the first one talks about the cowardly. You know who the cowardly are, church? The cowardly are people who are convinced that God is real. Convinced and enough to even meet on a Sunday morning and sing songs, but they're not convicted enough to tell anybody about him. It troubles my soul that we have allowed two, maybe three generations slip through in most congregations of the Lord's church who have never heard what I call as a hellfire and brimstone sermon. And some of you know what I'm talking about because some of you were raised on them. In fact, some of you can remember 30, 40, 50 years ago, some guy, he'd get up in a pulpit like this and he'd be getting lathered up talking about it. Or or how about this? Any of you in this room remember tent meetings? Where I came from, we used to always have them in August. I'm like, hottest month of the year, right? And and there's this guy, he's up there describing hell to a T. 
And you're sitting out there thinking to yourself, I can't sleep tonight. Because you knew your name wasn't in the book of life. And so what did you do when they started that invitation song? You stepped out, you obeyed the gospel. And yet today, here's what I'm hearing from our our children, church. I'm hearing young people say, oh, it's all good, Mr. Brad, because, you know, I believe in that God of the New Testament, that God of love and grace. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, well, the God of the New Testament is also the God of the Old. Please don't miss this point right here. You can't appreciate the love and the grace of Almighty God unless you comprehend His wrath. That's why the flood account was such a big deal. I realize what I'm about to say is somewhat radical, but if I could do one thing that would change the dynamics of this congregation for the rest of your life, I would love for just 10 seconds to rip back the lid on hell and expose everybody to it. 10 seconds is all it would take. Because can you imagine the sounds you'd hear? The sight, the smell. Folks, 10 seconds of that, I promise you, those of you who came in here just convinced this morning, I guarantee you, you'd leave here convicted about it. In fact, those of you in this room who've been meaning to talk to your coworker about Jesus, 10 seconds of this, you would not wait until you saw your coworker Monday morning. After 10 seconds of that, you'd be out in the parking lot on your cell phone saying, hey, uh, we need to talk. And those of you parents in this room who've been praying that your child would obey the gospel, you would not even leave this building. You would take them by the arm, find an empty classroom, and say, look, we got to study right now. This is too serious. And yet instead, here's what we do. We keep allowing our friends and our family to step out into eternity because we're afraid we may offend them. All the while, we slowly get desensitized to sin. We we don't think about sin being a stench in the nostrils of God. And as a result, we watch TV shows that are a stench in the nostrils of God. We look at videos that are a stench in the nostrils of a holy God. We wear clothes that are a stench in the nostrils of a holy God. We listen to music lyrics that are a stench in the nostrils of a holy God. Oh, we're convinced he's real. We're just not real convicted about it. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31 says, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Every person in this room is going to do it one day. I started this lesson by asking you a question. I'm going to finish by simply looking at each one of you and asking you, Are you just convinced that God is real? Or are you convicted enough to pick up your hammer and do something with it? Now, I'll be honest with you. If you are in this room and you're not a Christian, having heard all of that, I don't know how you go home today and have a peaceful, easy nap. But let me tell you something. When I started praying about this particular meeting, I was not praying about your nap. I was praying about your soul. If you are here and you understand Jesus died for you, you're now willing, ready to repent of your sins, to confess his name before men. You're ready and willing to be buried with him in baptism for the remission of your sins. Let me ask you, what are you waiting on? Because if you know you ought to do something, but you're putting it off, that's called disobedience. Today is the day of salvation. And I promise you, you do that, and the angels will rejoice, and we will too. Amen? This morning, I'm extending this invitation a whole lot broader. Because I know when a guy like me starts an invitation, those of us who've been baptized, we kind of put him on mute. We start thinking about lunch, and yet here's the reality. There's some of you in this room, if you were honest with me, you just walked in here convinced, not real convicted. In fact, there are some of you in this room that you know you need to tighten up at home. 
You, you know you need to either be a, a better parent, a, a better spouse, a better young person. There's some of you in this room, you realize you've kind of over time etched back out onto that broad way. This morning, I am calling you home. Now, I know coming forward is not all that popular anymore, which is, by the way, that's sad. Because if there should ever be a place where you feel comfortable asking for prayers, it ought to be with your church family, church. We're not all fine. Some of us in this room are broken. And this morning, I'm asking you to come home, take up your cross, follow him. We're going to sing this song of encouragement. As we do so, I, I simply want you to examine yourself. Don't worry about the person beside you, behind you, in front of you. Just examine yourself. And if you realize you need to make a change in your life, it is my prayer that you'll have the courage this morning. I'll meet you halfway down the aisle if that's what it takes. But let's get ourselves, let's get our children to heaven. Amen? This morning as we sing this song of encouragement, if we can pray with you, for you, if you're ready to make a change with your life, then please have the courage to come as together we stand and we sing.